Should I? Uh, go. Hello and a very warm afternoon to all of you. Already it's very warm. So just being excited for this webinar. So today we have a webinar organized by Global School of Business and Commerce, Global University Saharanpur on blockchain and its use cases, a very prominent topic these days, especially in lockdown when cryptocurrencies are under a role. And today we have Mr. Gaurav Sunwanshi with us, a leading blockchain expert in India. And then we have Mr. Shafiul Lanis, head of Local School of Business and Commerce. We also have Dr. Anwar with us, will be handling all the technicalities of the session. And then myself, Dr. Kanupriya Gupta, assistant professor in GSBC, Local School of Business and Commerce. So I hope everyone is equally excited as I am. So, Gaurav, I'll be handling it over to you. But first, let me introduce uh, Gaurav is a CEO and co-founder of Emotech Innovations Private Limited. He is graduate from IIM Lucknow and a computer science engineer. He has worked extensively with state of Chhattisgarh, where he conducted the state's first pilots using blockchain for e-governance, land record management, health record management, and other use cases. He also conducted the state government's first ever blockchain hackathon and is a member of Africa Blockchain Alliance. He co-authored Uh, I think we have lost uh, Kanupriya. Is that the case? Anwar? Yes, we keep voice telling you. Huh. Uh, okay, so uh, <laughs> I will take, a, take over from here. Uh, for some technical reason, Kanupriya is not uh, able to join again. Uh, so I would hand over to Gaurav uh, without uh, taking much of our time. Uh, yeah. So Gaurav, yeah. over to you and uh, you may please start the discussion. Thank yes, you, Gaurav. Thank you for joining us on the behalf of Local School of Business and Commerce. I welcome you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you so Please. much, uh, uh, Kanu Gupta, ma'am, uh, Anwar, uh, sir, and uh, Shafiullah Bhai. Uh, just one thing that I'd like to add here. Uh, Shafiullah Bhai was my senior at IIM Lucknow. So that's how the that's how long the connection goes. And it's almost a decade back now. And uh, we always stayed in touch. In fact, uh, how I when I was when I got in touch with blockchain, uh, and all the work that I did, uh, he was always around. So that's why uh, it's uh, it's really great for me that I'll have this opportunity to present my work to him while also conducting this same session. So uh, yes, for everyone, what we are going to focus upon in the, in the next 45 minutes is to understand the basic concepts that underlie uh, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, what are these, what is the difference between them and what are the similarities, and then move on to the new cases. So how it is going to change the world, how it has already changed the world, and what still lies in our own hands when it comes to guiding the direction of this, the trajectory of this technology. So I have a presentation uh, for that, and I'll be sharing it. So what we are going to learn together primarily is uh, it might be a surprise for someone is a basic of accounting. Then, of course, how did or Bitcoin come into place? Concepts behind it, and then significant use cases, as well as what we're doing with the farmers. Now, here over here, uh, why accounting is important? Because everything that you relate with computer science, most of it goes back at least a century, not more than that, right? But when it comes to blockchain, its uh, legacy dates back to at least. 600 years goes back to 14th century and how it is that will come to be so before we begin i always try to talk about the six laws of technology penned down by malvin Kerensberg because it's very important to put everything in the context 
So uh, the first is the first law that technology is neither good nor bad. That's obvious. But the latter part is important. That it is neither neutral. Neutral means that it will either take the side of the powerful or the powerless, depending upon the structure. And if we are aware of this, then probably we can guide it for a more equitable future. Second, emotion is a matter of necessity. That's almost a phrase right now. And technology comes in packages, big and small. So Bitcoin came in 2008-2009. It was only limited with cryptocurrency. Right now, it has exploded. There was just a disturbance in the voice. Then the fourth point: all the technology might be a prime element in many public issues, but it is the non-technical factors which will take precedence in technology policy decisions. So. Where it, what is non-technical? Non-technical is every one of us. So how we react to technology, how our ignorance or our knowledge, in either case, that is what shapes the future of technology. All history is relevant, but the history of technology is the most relevant, and it is a very human activity, just like the history of technology. And I have also conducted blockchain workshops. The same slides that I'm going to show you have been displayed in other places as well. I have taught at IS officers. I am Bangalore. Um, in US, in Cambridge, and other places. So the same gist of the same workshops. That is what I'm going to try to deliver over here right now. So first, try to understand what are people saying about blockchain because some people might be aware of the hype, some people might not be aware of the hype. And so yeah, so the World Economic Forum says something very important that unlike the internet alone, blockchains are distributed. They are not centralized. They are open and not hidden. They are more inclusive. Not exclusive, they cannot be altered, and they are secure. And they give us an unprecedented capability to create and trade value in society. So that's World Economic Forum. William Mugayar, the author, has said that blockchain cannot be described just as a revolution; it is a tsunami-like phenomena. John McAfee, uh, he said that you must know him through the McAfee antivirus. You can't stop things like Bitcoin or blockchain. It will be everywhere, and the world will have to readjust. The world governments will have to readjust. And uh, Rajna Singh, uh, so Rajna Singh is also the author of a very brilliant book titled "The Bitcoin Saga." You can order it online or get it anywhere. It's really, it, it's a really nice book. She says that politics, rather than technology, is the largest single factor that will decide the future of Bitcoin and blockchain. So that's why it is very important for us to understand so that we don't remain only passive recipients of whatever decisions are being handed down. So we'll just begin, and first we'll let go of some formalities from out of our way. So the formalities will, of course, begin from understanding that there is always three things that you should keep in your mind whenever someone is throwing the word cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, or blockchain. So what are the three distinct ideas? Of course, there is an overlap, but in and of itself, these are independent ideas. The first is the Bitcoin currency. So the Bitcoin currency is an independent idea itself. The second is the specific type of blockchain which is underlying that Bitcoin currency. What does this mean? Tomorrow, let's say we all start saying that instead of Bitcoin, we are going to call it Bit Gold, and instead of tracking cash, we'll use the same technology to track what is happening with gold. It will still work flawlessly, right? So there is an underlying specific architecture based upon which you and me have taken the decision that we will call it Bitcoin. And use it only as a substitute for currency. So there is a specific architecture, and on top of that, there is a specific use case. These are two different things, although they are dependent. And the third one is the idea of blockchain in general. Let us try to understand this more deeply with the help of an example. Let's say take the example of a phone network. So at the most abstract level, there is only an idea of a phone network that there are towers, there are certain protocols. And certain wavelengths uh, that will be used, certain devices that will be used for communication. This is just an idea of a phone network, right? Similarly, there's just just a abstract idea of a blockchain. It could comprise of many things, but it exists at an abstract level. Now, when you try to become more specific on the phone side, let's say a specific phone network like Jio or Vodafone. Here we are talking about a specific architecture. Similarly, in the blockchain, now we can go one more level specific and say that yes, this is. Blockchain type A, 
block, mm-hmm. let's say this is the public blockchain what is or it can be a private blockchain because there is no single type of blockchain out there it's a all variety they all come under the same you could say the mega species which we call blockchain now let's say on based on the particular architecture you are trying to use it for a certain case so similar for example i am trying to use the vodafone network only and only for calling i am not using it for sms or mobile data let's say i am only using it for specifically like a calling similarly that specific blockchain when it is used for a specific purpose then it becomes a bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency because i can take the same technology that is happening with bitcoin and let's say everyone decides that we will as i said we will call it bit gold and we will only track gold now the technology will not change much it will be more or less the same and still the use case has differed so bitcoin as a cryptocurrency is a use case of a specific type of architecture of blockchain but at the same time as we said the idea of a blockchain exists at a much larger abstract level so that is why this is much very important for you to know today what has happened is that the world is divided into two parts and they will never meet because it's very natural everything began with bitcoin yes there is no arguing that bitcoin was the first use of blockchain in 2009 3rd january the first bitcoin was mined and that after four or five years people realized that it is not just cryptocurrencies so yes after bitcoin then there were similar cryptocurrencies after a while four or five years people realized that we can use the same code for many other things why not why just currency we can use it for land records your securing your health records maybe even securing your aadhar data maybe even doing voting on blockchain many other things the same could so right now the world is divided into two parts the first is cryptocurrencies and tokenizations which is what we call icos so that is a completely different world and the second part where people are using blockchain for public services or enterprise solutions and they are replacing traditional ways of running anything it could be as i said even your educational degrees could be handed out on blockchain to make them more secure this also includes blockchain for social impact so imagine in your mind that everything began with bitcoin then there was a divergence and people who wanted to stay in the cryptocurrency world now we have thousands of cryptocurrencies and that's a separate world altogether the second world is trying to use the same code that was used for cryptocurrencies change it of course to f- suit the specific use case and see whether it really helps there or not so that is i would say as a personal bias much more exciting part the second part where it could be any domain you could be in education you could be a doctor or a ca or anything and you have the complete independence to see whether the promises of blockchain which were not offered by the traditional technologies whether those promises are useful to you can they help you to revolutionize your sector okay but we have to talk about bitcoin and for bitcoin we have to know about accounting so how did accounting first i know that this is a rather tedious subject that's why we are not going to go into it so we are just trying to understand at a sing, at a larger level initially the first historical account of accounting belongs to the 5000 year old cuneiform tablets where people were only making simple entries for like, let's say there is an entry of how many rocks or stones were brought how many logs of wood were brought so it is the same kind of list which is it's a grocery list basically which you take from your parents and go out for shopping that grocery list is a single entry accounting if it sounds simple please know that all the pyramids all the forts everything was built based upon the simple single entry accounting only now single entry accounting is good for accounting uh, at a central level but it is not at all good for trade because my grocery list says something else there are many other shopkeeper might say something else how do you reconcile so what happened was that this person came into picture so the person in front of you on the screen his father luca pacioli he is the he is the one who taught mathematics to leonardo da vinci and he is also called the father of modern accounting he say he introduced the concept of double entry bookkeeping so for example if um, some of you might have had the experience if you have a salary at the end of every month or on the first date of every month it will say that your salary account has been credited as for so and so or whenever you spend debited and so and so so this simple system that if one account has having a credit then the other account should show a debit and keeping your accounting books in such a manner that there should be credit debit uh, accounts receivables expend uh, um, expenditure and so on 
this simple system enabled trade because whenever there was a change in one account the other account was similarly reflected that's how banks work today the same concepts is being used even right now in our banking sector so even the ca uh, if you do a chartered accounting course they will they will be studying the same principles more or less sim similar which were introduced by father luca pacioli so it's great with you know trading but there are some problems because whenever there is a disagreement then you have to rely on a central authority it could be a judge or a court now that is why judges and banks and all of them these central authorities started gaining more prominence because there were some shortcomings into the double entry bookkeeping record and so we needed an external third party to negotiate to act as an arbiter similarly the transaction fees can be really huge especially during remittances because the banks will keep a lot of money if you want to let's say send money here from to other other country and the last problem was the most important one you don't know what's happening with your money because the double entry bookkeeping gave birth to the banking system and the banking system is basically who's doing the most of the investments and on your part and that is also what led to the 2008 dip depression so in 1989 there was just an idea now 1989 is even the before the birth of emails and everything forget blockchain so there was a scientist yuri ijiri yeah, he was a chartered accountant he said that what if we could combine the concepts of cryptography cryptography is using basically mathematics to encode your data so what if we could combine cryptography and accounting in such a manner that the third entry would not be a separate entry rather the both the cre entries credit debit or any kind of transaction those entries would be made on such a platform which would be immutable so that was the idea he put forth and triple entry bookkeeping is also you could say a nickname for blockchain as well so satoshi nakamoto he never referred to this of course but but he did does talk about yuri ijiri so imagine that the idea of just having a platform on which if you write something that is like hum jaise kehte hai patthar ki lakeer ho gayi wo to wo patthar ki lakeer jaisa agar ho jata hai to many of the disputes could be solved then and there not all but at least most so what are the advantages of triple entry bookkeeping so it provides between two parties over a transaction and the transaction could be everything it provides trust the trust word is missing in the first sentence and the third entry is actually a proof of the event something has happened and cannot be faked so double entry mein jo ho raha tha those things are still the same so double entry one person is making some change it's getting reflected into the other person's account but this is instead of happening in a banking database this is now happening on a blockchain platform which is what makes it unchangeable immutable and the the power to declare an objectivity that is one of the uh, objective reality that because it was written on so and so date it cannot be changed because those are the laws of mathematics and cryptography it is protected by that hence you can be rest assured that the data was not tampered with that is the primary advantage of blockchain it is just a database the only advantage is that it is it cannot be immutable it's immutable and it does not rest under the control of many people and we'll see to that how does it happen so 2008 when the entire banking system crashed and people lost faith into the banking system this paper was released so it's hardly a dozen pages long with and the author is satoshi nakamoto who is called the founder of bitcoin but the identity is still not revealed and it is all but you can see how many bitcoins satoshi moto nakamoto account has it's public so blockchain is providing both things 100% transparency for example satoshi nakamoto decides to spend bitcoins everyone can see but it's also providing anonymity all the big agencies from uh, cbi to nia all, all these big ones are trying to find out the identity of the person they have not been able to it we don't know whether it's a man or a woman or a group of persons because that's the he, that's the power of blockchain right whenever you want 100% transparency it will be 100% transparent if you want some portion to be entirely your own or completely private it will be your own now this paper gave birth to blockchain now before we again go ahead with that this is a very important concept we understood one nickname of blockchain which was triple entry bookkeeping the other technical definition of blockchain is it is a decentralized and distributed database what does it mean whenever we talk about centralization or a decentralization we are talking about control only control so for example 
all the atms of your bank they are distributed all across the all across the country right but they are centrally controlled hence your banking system is centralized distributed is a very important it's a very easy term i mean distributed means that your physical data the location of your physical data it's not in one place it's in multiple places for example let's take the example of the atms again atms are distributed because they are physically at different places it's as simple as that similarly if my laptop from which i am giving my presentation the data which is present on the hard drives that is non distributed so uh, there is no point in showing a fourth diagram for a non distributed because it will just be a single dot what is bitcoin or blockchain bitcoin is ट्रांजेक्शनो Uh, the transaction that we are putting is how much of methi or coriander or grapes all of that is been moving so data could be anything within a block now one block is mathematically connected with the next block so for example block number 400 is directly mathematically connected with block number 399 in such a manner that let's say there are 500 blocks if a hacker comes or if even i as a owner of a data if i try to do any kind of mischief or even mistake in block number let's say 251 if i do anything then what happens is everything from block number 251 till block number 500 will show a red flag that there is there is a certain kind of mischief which has occurred so that is why it is called a block chain because we put data in blocks and we create a mathematical chain in such a way that every preceding block is linked with the previous block in such a manner that any kind of mischief or mistake or editing done with the previous block will directly show a red flag and directly tell us that the every preceding block after that will give a red flag so that i can pinpoint that block number 251 something has occurred there someone has tried to do some mistake or mischief so that is the whole power and because everything is public so this database where does it exist who, who controls the bitcoin database the answer is thousands of people if let's say even 100 people of them for some reason lose their electricity and the servers run down doesn't matter because everyone else still has the same copy right okay so what are the properties of blockchain it's distributed it's immutable distributed as we see because it's present in and many locations it is immutable because we saw that you cannot really change it provenance is just a fancy word of saying that we can provide a track record for example whenever you order something from flipkart and amazon and you can check on your delivery app that how far the delivery has come at what center it is so that is a provenance provenance is just seeing the track record trustless is a word we used in the bitcoin and blockchain world a lot but it is sometimes misleading when we say trustless we don't say that it, it doesn't mean that it lacks trust it means that trust is inbuilt within the blockchain so you don't need trust from a third party that is why bitcoin doesn't have any bank it doesn't have a customer care number it just exists on its own based on the simple power of democratically using the entire structure of blockchain of course it is secure and then real time so for example today i wish to send money to a send some amount of money to a really remote country it might take a lot longer for the money to reach there because it will jump between many banks and before it is finally getting reflected into 
the other person's accounts in some another country a lot of commission fees will also be given but in bitcoin or block uh, cryptocurrencies nothing like that the moment you transfer all across the world the databases will show at the same time that yes it has been transferred because everyone keeps the same copy of the bitcoin or the blockchain database so as i see again blockchain is a way of arranging the data blocks of data arranged mathematically in a chain and bitcoin is a use of that chain okay now we'll go to the use cases part so use cases how will blockchain change the internet primarily so i encourage all of you to just go on website uh, google later on and just google social media blockchain so for example on facebook what is the revenue model of facebook you create good content it gets shared across your friends will consume the content and the marketing agencies based on their algorithms how much of their ads are getting exposed they will end up paying the money to whom they end up paying money to mark zuckerberg has he made the content has he consumed the content nothing but he gets the money at least a somewhat better revenue model exists with youtube in youtube after you exceed a certain amount of views and ex certain amount of parameters youtube will at least pay you some money right so what if there was a revenue model incentive based blockchain social media platform where if you are making a good post it is getting shared across then the marketing agencies will pay you and there will be no mark zuckerberg present here to get paid this is already live there are six social media blockchain platforms that are already live the last time i checked but it was again a, time, a long time ago they are just trying to optimize it and make it more user friendly at the same time this is also supposed to stop the emergence of fake news and fake trolls because if you could track fake news coming out of some certain nodes only you can simply download and red flag those nodes so this is what people are trying to do because internet is good for sharing data it is not good for transferring value what is the difference if i am sharing a meme with you i will still own a copy of that meme but if i want to send money to you which is transfer of value then it should be it's very important that the copy of that money should be deleted from my account so that is the difference between transferring value and sharing information internet is perfect for sharing information it is absolutely not good for transferring value that is why we have the banks have to go into so many checks and changes and sometimes your money takes four to five days of business days and so on to get reflected into your account the next use case so this is something that we are also trying to work with is with mersk mersk is one of the largest shipping containers in the world they manage 150 ports and 2 to 3 million 20 to 30 lakh containers are getting tracked are getting shipped and the amount of business that there is flowing through their vessels it's are close to 4 trillion dollars it's not a revenue it's just how much of worth of goods they are shipping from one place to other now one vessel or a ship it makes at least 200 interactions with different officers it's an average number before going from port a to port b and the documentation required for this is like 4 inches thick for just one vessel just one ship now mars they have deployed hundreds of blockchain engineers since the past 5 or 6 years and i'm working on the uh, project called trade lens alongside them so what they want to do is they want to ensure that the entire documentation we will just keep have a blockchain of records so all the officers will have as a simple app connected with blockchain and all the checks and regulations and guidelines will be followed in and updated in real time so what has happened after blockchain they have removed the paper documentation almost completely the oracle problem will come to that what it means and there's an increase in 15% number of ships and vessels that could go in and out due to faster logistics so just because the documentation has been made faster or rather paperless and the trust factor which is, which is very necessary when you're dealing with officers from different countries and different ports that trust factor is coming through blockchain so 15% more number of uh, ships which has also helped them to reduce the 10 to 15% of operational cost and for a company whose revenue is in billions of dollars that's a huge number now what will happen with supply chains how will supply chain be transformed we already saw what bitcoin can do in cryptocurrencies and finance sector so that is done so that's why i'm trying to more give more focus on what happens with blockchain in other places so this is a traditional supply chain that you have in front of you where 
people are basically planning sourcing and delivering based upon what happened this is a traditional supply chain now if you let's say you have a secure database which is a blockchain you also have an intelligent real time monitoring system which could be artificial intelligence you also have real time data capturing mechanism which is your small small devices or sensors which we fancily called iot internet of things iot is just basically sensors which will capture data and throw it to the internet throw it to a cloud and that cloud could be again blockchain based and that data could be analyzed by ai so what will happen in a digital supply chain and in many cases this has already happened the supply chains are getting radically transformed so we can predict what is happening with a certain order so i don't need to wait for an order based on the ai will tell me that certain order is coming because an automobile let's take the example of an automobile industry where there are hundreds of different suppliers and vendors all of them are independent how do you ensure trust and real time data tracking between them that is something blockchain can do so a combination of these three emerging technologies is now poised to transform the supply chain as well in fact this what you have in front of you is a very important example which is estonia it is impossible to talk about blockchain without talking about the small country called estonia estonia is as much as old as me 1990 i guess after the fall of the ussr the only thing that estonia has been doing after its birth is that give complete focus on digitization so what they first did don't be intimidated by the diagram i'll just explain it initially they said let us connect the different government departments health department land record rto different departments or let's connect them together on a blockchain platform and they said that yes this is working wonderfully the next thing they did is that they tried to combine not tried to successfully combine the public sector on the private sector on a blockchain platform so as a startup if i am registering for uh, let's say a new company then a public sector is now interacting with the private sector right so this interaction is being made much more faster and reliable in fact you as an indian citizen can register a company in estonia right now all you have to do is file for an e residency program get your passport from the estonia residency uh, estonia embassy in delhi and register your company in estonia without even leaving india ever that is the kind of uh, uh, advancement that they have achieved in fact indian government keeps on sending our is officers to estonia to conduct trips and see that see learn from them but estonia did not just stop there estonia is now connecting two countries on a blockchain platform that is the project called x road so estonia and finland are connect are creating a blockchain interface it must have been already been completed by by now this is an old image 2018 so imagine that is the kind of trust and speed and paperless and digitized environment that they are able to create so estonia is extremely important similarly netherlands has been doing the same thing they are very aggressive department which exist in a government and chances are that they would be doing some kind or the other pilot over there now i'll just try to explain a little bit more on my project with the farmers right now i'm speaking from nashik nashik it's a 4 hour drive from mumbai i am working with india's largest farmer collective uh, sayadri farms of more than uh, 8000 farmers and what are they trying to achieve and all of these farmers are small land holding farmers they are not like 50 acre big landlords and all these are small land holding farmers with an average land holding of 1 hectare so i'll just try to uh, use the next 10 minutes in explaining that what is the project that i am doing so what you have in front of you is a real receipt of a farmer named vikram kolle where he went to sell 1300 kilograms of onions but instead of getting any money he was asked to pay money because the middleman basically slapped transportation and storage charges upon the person and upon the farmer vikram kolle and he was simply scared away and this is not an exception this is the norm because the model of a small land holding indian farmer being independent and sustainable is impossible so what is happening is that farmers are coming together and farmers are trying to form farmer collectives so which is where i work 8000 farmers have come together and they are all working in unison just a second yes 
so what we are trying to do so we are trying to connect we are in collaboration with the farmer collective we have built a project called agro trust agro trust is the name of the entire product the whole purpose of agro trust is basically to connect the farmers with the consumers now the consumers could even be an export consumers sitting in middle east or europe or singapore but we have to connect them with the farmers working in nashik the small land holding farmers how will it happen first we will onboard the entire farmer collective on the platform so all the farmers transactions whatever they are producing or whatever rates they are getting paid for everything will be tracked and input on the blockchain platform at the same time this can th what you see in front of you is very incomplete right this is not a value chain in order to ensure that the customer or the farmers have complete view of the value chain we have to ensure that each and every point in the value chain is also a part of a platform so this is what we have been doing since past more than a year to onboard each and every entity at least one value chain or a supply chain a complete end to end onboarding has to be there and this is what we achieved in march where we are tracking each and every point so there are no missing gaps there are no filling filling the blanks so what is happening is that the farmers can see what is happening with their produce after it is even getting sold and how it is traveling what is the wastage what are the value additions what are the price margins of wholesalers and all at the same time what are the consumers seeing consumers are entitled to three kinds of information the first is know your food so of course they can see about the entire details including the plantation date as well so for example if the uh, consumer has bought a packet of fenugreek methi then the they can see just by scanning on the qr code that the methi was basically planted by a farmer named so and so on this geographical location we have also linked it with google maps and for that the farmer was paid so and so amount of rupees per kg so the farmer can see the consumer can see all the details about the food the consumer can see all the details regarding the farmer as well and the consumer can also see what is happening with the money so for example if the consumer is paying 100 rupees once they scan the qr code and we are printing 4000 qr codes daily even today uh, more than 4500 qr codes are printed so once you scan the qr code you get to see uh, your mrp is linked with it so let's say you end up paying 100 rupees so out of those 100 rupees how much is the farmer getting how much is the farmer collective's management getting what are the cuts of the transporters logistics reports and so on this kind of transparency is unprecedented but again this whole idea of bringing such kind of revolution in agriculture belongs to the farmers only so that is why i said understanding blockchain is important because it is the domain experts who will really be able to use blockchain not developers like me so more than a year ago while i was conducting blockchain workshops i was teaching blockchain to the farmers in marathi language and it is they who gave this entire idea that if we do this if blockchain can provide four properties then what if we use it for so and so and similarly once you have the whole value chain in place we can now provide some services on top of it as well this doesn't end here now the real prop the real vision which came up with uh, the continuous discussion with farmers was that blockchain can still be used further right so let us talk about farmer collective as i said a farmer collective is just a group of farmers coming together based on their geography so geography is the constraint so let's say there's a farmer collective number 1 fc1 and it is composed of different farmers let's say it has 200 grape farmers 100 onion farmers 500 tomato farmers 50 mango farmers and so on now 50 kilometers apart or let's say 100 kilometers apart there is a second farmer collective and let's say it, it has similar number of crop farmers 50 grape farmers 1000 onion farmers and so currently at this moment in isolation currently india has 7000 such farmer collectives registered and all of them are working independently or the rather the right word is in isolation so let's say there are n number of farmer collectives so and so so now the idea that we came across was what if we could connect the same crop farmers across different collectives on a single blockchain so what i would have is a nashik group uh, nashik grape blockchain talking with an aurangabad or a pune grape blockchain and both of them would now be negotiating with the market so this is how we are trying to increase the whole 
negotiating and bargaining power as well as the entire strength of the farmers by connecting them with each other so farmers already came together on the farmer collective that is what they already did there are 7000 more and many more are coming up so our mission that we are trying to bring to life is can we connect same crop farmers and create basically crop specific blockchains because if you can focus on the crop then the crop gets good returns and who will the returns go to obviously they'll go to the farmer in order to do this we are using the technology called digital twinning on blockchain digital twinning basically means for example you must have seen the movie uh, judwa right by salman khan whenever something one happens to one twin the other twin is also getting affected so similarly whenever the so if something happens to let's say for example grapes in the real world if they are rotten if they are not kept in a good temperature if they are thrown away if there is a reduction in the weight wastage everything that happens over there the digital twin is reflected onto the blockchain so this is the kind of technology that we are trying so this is the innovation that we brought brought forth and this is what is we hope is just a hope at this moment that farmers will be actively joining farmer collectives to get more rid of the traditional problems and hurdles so in order to ensure that farmer collectives becomes a a very uh, tempting model for the farmers uh, rather say or a beneficial model we have to ensure that the farmer collectives themselves are getting benefited so this is the project that we are currently on to and with that i'll just like to end with this quote that uh, the electric light did not come from the continuous improvement of candles so sometimes we just have to come forth and bring the electric light blockchain could be that in fact if you understand the principles no matter what domain you work in there is a chance that you could possibly test out some use cases on your own because the real change will not come from the developers the real change when it comes to the blockchain will only come from the domain experts that is why it is very important because many of us missed the whole internet bus right internet bus was completely taken over by giants like amazon and others but there were many unrealized potentials that could have happened back then so similarly now when the second wave has come for big technology and on a similar or even a larger scale than internet we have to ensure that the guiding Uh, that I make to end the presentation and uh, open my question up to questions. Uh, Gaurav, uh, some questions have been shared uh, with you uh, in the chat box. Okay. Uh, so you may pick them and answer as as per your convenience, yeah. whatever you feel like. Well, I'll help you out, Gaurav, in this. Okay. Uh, first, the question people are asking is that there are a lot of cryptocurrencies, but most famous are Bitcoin and Ripple. So, is there any technological difference between these? Yes, yes. Uh, so, for example, uh, Bitcoin, because it's the most original one, it works on algorithms which are very energy consuming, or it is not too good for like complete transparency and all. So, every cryptocurrency tweaks the original code. and it says that ripple will now provide this we will now provide that so ethereum does not work on the same code as uh, the same algorithm as bitcoin so yes there are minor differences but it's just the details not not much okay so is there a question on the legality of bitcoin also like in india or in other countries is it legal or illegal people have doubts about that also yes so i in india the stance is that we are ambiguous regarding what to do about it because we don't know whether to treat bitcoin as cash or bitcoin as gold whether it is a asset or a cash so we are ambiguous so that is why i was also invited over to present and teach blockchain to the is officials of the ncr government but they are trying to understand more in many countries it is completely banned as well as in countries like japan in 2017 they passed the bill making it completely legal so you can even buy ice cream in japan using bitcoin so the legality will differ from country to country but you also shared example of estonia who on the basis of blockchain they had developed a lot yes right? yes exactly so even that is also happening so positive sides are also there yes right so in the future also like people are asking that uh, it went down for a little bit of time period so will it rise again is there any future in this 
personally, I would. Uh, I'm very open about it. I do not invest, and I just try to keep a mere dense distance because my entire philosophy is that I want to use the code for something else. So there should not be like uh, any kind of even uh, superficial conflict of interest that should arise. So I'm very clear that my expertise will only be in the user use for social impact. For mm-hmm. cryptocurrency, I purposefully try to remain aloof. So, does it promote black money also? Any illegal activities like uh, a cash, but not you get cash? Uh, yes. So that is one uh, one of the uh, criticisms that is Bitcoin, which I completely agree with. But it's not the kind of argument which leads to the conclusion that let us stop using Bitcoin. So, it, the need for having uh, you know doing illegal stuff or illegal transactions or unethical stuff that need is there by human society. Block, uh, Bitcoin is only facilitating it. So, in absence of Bitcoin, probably they'll find some another way. But that doesn't mean that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah. It depends on person to person. Yeah. Right. So, there is one more question. If you have one Bitcoin, can I directly credit it in my account? In India, no. Uh, still in the legal legal part. Uh, outside, you'll have to. It's just like a share market now. So you trade Bitcoin with a certain number of dollars, and that value keeps on changing. So there's a running joke also that uh, father says that uh, the son says to father, "Father, I have bought ten uh, Bitcoins," and then the mm-hmm. father says, "Ten Bitcoins? How can you spend five lakh rupees? You know, you know how much I have tried to earn this three lakh rupees, and I don't know when. What will you do with this one lakh rupees?" So it's just a joke, which means that before he could finish three sentences. The value of the Bitcoin chain price. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, can you give a little more illustration on what are the different areas where Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin can be applied or blockchain can be applied, like in HR department or in marketing? So, can blockchain be used in these areas also, other than finance? Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I see one more question about education. So, I'd like to talk about education. How blockchain and education can emerge? So the university of a uh, university, the ISB College, Indian School mm-hmm. of Business, Hyderabad. So over there, Hyderabad. Mr. Professor, yeah, Hyderabad. So Professor Bhagwan Chaudhary, he is my co-editor on the journal. He is trying to introduce blockchain for all their certificates. So your educational certificates, rather than getting printed, they can they will be based on the blockchain platform. So let's say there is a recruiter. All the recruiter has to do is scan your resume. The moment you scan your resume, they can see on the blockchain platform that it is a valid certificate, that it was not forged. So mm-hmm. now, what you see is uh, it's a very straightforward use case, not much complex. A final year students can do it. But what people are really trying to do in the education sector, there is a very beautiful TED talk uh, from the I think she's a professor at University of Bologna in Italy, where she says that what if we could ensure that. Education, the very meaning of education could be made more broader. What does it mean? So, for example, even though right now I am working for a startup, but for two days I was doing content working for someone else. For mm-hmm. one month, I, I, am, I might be doing even gardening ads for someone else. So, mm-hmm. what if we ha- have just a big blockchain platform where people are validating each other's work? That is, they have the provided so and so service. So, your resume is not just dependent on your degree, but it is much more organic. It is capturing all the little works you've done. Your complete personality could be shown, and so they are trying to create a world, convert, converting the whole world into university. So that is the kind of project that they are leading at the University of Bologna in Italy. And it is one of the oldest universities, and yeah, okay. so there's a beautiful TED talk from that. Okay, well, that was informative. So has Python any role to do with this blockchain technology? Which one? Python. People yeah. want to know that is Python anyway related yeah. to blockchain technology? There is a free course in Udemy right now called Building Blockchain Using Python. Okay. I mean, yeah. My team is using Node.js for doing the same thing, but it also depends. If you are using Ethereum, you will have to know Solidity. So, yeah, all the blockchain platforms have their own specific languages, but they are very similar to the rest of the world. So, it should not be a so, Haridi, I'm all taking the last question now. Uh, whether private blockchain is used in your venture or consortium blockchain? Who is mining the blocks? So, what? Yeah. Consortium blockchain is almost uh, there's a big overlap between them. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, yeah. So we are not a public blockchain, of course, because it is the farmer's data that we are tracking, and it's not that everyone can come. So it is a permission blockchain, permission private blockchain. What does it mean? Mm-hmm. Is that we are giving the authority of inputting information, certain kinds of information only to the farmer. Certain kinds of information, let's say, what is happening with the retail only to the retailer. In Bitcoin, you can do transactions with everyone, right? So that's a public blockchain. You can also become a Bitcoin owner and so on. But farmer collective, by their definition, so yeah, you cannot become a part of a farmer collective if you don't own a land within a certain area. So whatever happens with the real world, we try to mimic it over here. Hence, our blockchain is permission. We give permissions, special permissions to special people, and it is private. So that yeah. Well, I really thank you, Karan. For such a, uh, I have uh, a I have a question. Yes. 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 I have sure. a question. There are few people who are like uh, who have asked question uh, recently, very recently. Uh, like uh, the questions are, uh, if suppose I am a student or I am a developer, how do I enter into this field of blockchain? What languages uh, should I learn? What uh, technologies should I learn? Uh, they those who want to start from very basic. So can you guide uh, them on that? Bitcoin is illegal is the blockchain also legal or Ill- yeah. illegal some kind of legality issues in india so can you throw light on these two questions so in 2018 rbi came up with a mandate in which they said that we are holding off our decision regarding how to decide what happens with bitcoin and cryptocurrency in the same paragraph they have said that at the same time we wholly encourage the mass adoption of blockchain so they want blockchain to be in everywhere big race going on who will do the first blockchain pilot for land records first blockchain pilot for health records and so on so blockchain as a technology is getting adopted at a very aggressive scale for what purpose it's a different question whether they really want to bring in change or just want to cash in on the hype that's another question but as a technology there is a full green signal in fact there is a big race now and for the earlier question i would first rather suggest that it's very important for us to understand the whole philosophy of blockchain so just begin with youtube video so watch youtube videos from number 5 computer file and three view one brown and first get a hang of what it all means so i would rather spend one whole month just knowing about the history and the concept and within the same video you will be given a guide that if you want to build a certain kind of blockchain How you should begin. What else? Those are already present. But unless we know what are we doing it for, there will not be enough motivation to see it through. So I will really recommend these three YouTube channels to start learning watching into. In fact, there is a YouTube channel, Three Blue One Brown, Three Blue One Brown by Grant Anderson. There is a 26 minute video on how does a Bitcoin work that has to be seen by each and every person. Okay. And now, uh, other aspects, yeah. So, what do you suggest to our students, like who want to go ahead and make a career in blockchain? So, some other milestones other than YouTube videos? Yes, so there are certifications as well. But uh, as I said, when we say career, there are things you do to brighten up your resume. There are things you do mm-hmm. to really to amp up your skills. Right. And sadly, exactly. they are sometimes they are not the same. So, right. uh, you can. They should definitely do the free courses provided by IBM. IBM provides mm-hmm. two certifications. that's mm-hmm. a very respected certification at the same time i would suggest that they should just take up some school project or a project with the local district authority saying that mm-hmm. what if you could migrate your uh, records it could be any record land record or um, electricity record what if we could migrate these records on a blockchain platform and they start building the project because unless and until they start building the projects on their own or it could even be the like what we did at isb hyderabad right as we hyderabad is encouraging everyone to bring all of their educational degrees and certificates from blockchain including the report cards as well which is rather a case which can be done by college student so oh, thank you so much gaurav uh, that was really a add on to my in- information and i hope for the other participants knowledge also and that was a new chapter that has been added to my knowledge uh, well i invite now my head uh, mr shafiul lanis for the thank you note so what do you shall do yeah 
thank you kanu uh, first of all i would like to thank all our audience uh, for taking mm -hmm. out time for uh, of one hour uh, to engage with us to ask questions and uh, we have around 325 people uh, from across the world people from abroad have also joined most of these people are professionals uh, some entrepreneurs are there students are there faculty members from universities across the country so i wish to thank you and i believe uh, you 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 uh, it must have been a very valuable session for you uh, thank you thank you for joining us uh, and uh, about gorav i don't know what to say and <laughs> where to start uh, I, I would say some on a very personal note, like uh, I have known God of for almost 10 years now. And uh, uh, apart from being an expert, uh, one of the first expert uh, in the country uh, who has started uh, propagating and influencing the idea of blockchain, uh, not only uh, not in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the sector of uh, cryptocurrency, but into the social sector. So he's... Uh, uh, and uh, that's how I know him because uh, uh, because I have uh, been reading him his uh, critical scholarship. Uh, he comes from uh, 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 he, uh, from a uh, uh, very very uh, uh, like social uh, uh, his uh, his social nature and his scholarship has been uh, anti caste right perspective of the farmers of people all across the country. Uh, that's how I have. I was always impressed with him. Uh, he's a great uh, poet, very creative. You should read him. You should follow him on uh, uh, Facebook if you can. Uh, and he's a very good cook, also. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you, Garam. Uh, thank you for being with us and sharing your knowledge. Uh, for me, uh, like uh, several people have asked me, what is uh, what is the blockchain? And I was like. Uh, which what I have distributed system, but I don't know exactly. It's very interesting, and but I thank you for uh, your your session has made a lot lot of those uh, systems, uh, a lot of have become clear, and I believe uh, that uh, most of the people who have joined us, they will use uh, this technology, they will promote this technology, and especially try to bring uh, like the. Uh, the social aspect of uh, uh, this technology has got an immense uh, uh, future, bringing equality, uh, working on equity uh, and discrimination, especially our farmers, a lot of farmers are committing suicide every year in our country. So I believe uh, when in the value chain, there is a right to um, proportion of value that goes to the farmers. I think that is the only way uh, we can save their life. Uh, instead of uh, appropriation of the, that value by someone who has got a capital or someone who is there in the, the field earlier. So uh, you're doing a great job, Gaurav. Uh, my congratulations, my support, and my... And thank you, Kanuman. Thank you. Uh, and I wish to... Uh, and I wish... I, I, I'm not finished yet. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish to thank uh, Dr. Kanupia Gupta. Uh, she's an excellent teacher. Uh, students uh, simply love her. Uh, she has been with us for more than four years, I believe. And uh, she's a PhD from IIT Roorkee and uh, MBA from HBTI Kanpur. And she teaches uh, human resource management in our department. Uh, and I also wish to thank uh, Dr. Anwar. Uh, he has taken care of all the technical uh, part of this uh, uh, whole session, and uh, he's a PhD from Jamia Millia Islamia, and uh, currently he's stuck in uh, uh, Delhi because of lockdown. But I'm happy that he's there with his family. Uh, I wish to thank Dr. Uh, Anwar and local university uh, uh, and local school of business commerce. We are uh, also organizing another uh, webinar on 15th of June. It is uh, COVID-19 pandemic and survival of micro, uh, small, and medium enterprises. And uh, the panel list, we have got all the international panels, uh, um, uh, like guests are there, there are three guests. Uh, Mr. M.D. Siddiqui is the Assistant Vice President of Research, India, Small and Medium Enterprise from Delhi. Dr. Alam Ahmed, Assistant Professor, Saudi Electronic University. And Dr. H.W. Akram, Assistant Pro Professor, Arba Munich University, Ethiopia. So all those who find uh, this uh, topic, uh, COVID and survival of uh, MSME, they may please uh, like register and join us, and Dr. Anwar would be moderating that event. And uh, finally, I would like to thank all the members of the uh, local school of business and commerce, and uh, and 
uh, our seniors in the university for uh, helping us or enabling us to make this, uh, to make this uh, um, webinar a great success. Uh, I wish you a very happy and safe time ahead. Please take uh, very good care of yourself. Uh, goodbye and have a very great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so you much, Gaurav. Thank you, Shafi. Uh, now, for all the participants, you'll be getting feedback form uh, in your email IDs, respective email IDs that you had given while registration. So that you can fill and send to me. And regarding your e-certificates also, those will be sending me the feedback form. They'll be receiving the e-certificate again through their same email IDs. So thank you so much, guys, for attending, for coming here, for sparing your precious time and making our event a grand success. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. And I want to give a big hand for Gaurav Somashi for a great session. Yeah, good. Very nice session. Thank you, Gaurav. Thank you very much.